grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, everyone. Well, this is the weekend where all roads lead to Glasgow. And some of the roads actually will be blocked off, but we'll just need to put up with that because it is an important time in the history of all the nations that will be taking part as plans are made, attitudes are formed with regard to the preservation of our planet. So our prayers are with all those who will be taking part, all those who will be in standby from our own nation, and in the hope that everything will work together for a hopeful future for succeeding generations. Let's worship God now as we sing together, O oh God, you are my God. weekend when the environment is very much on people's minds. We as Christian folk are reminded that the source of everything that we hear and touch and see is our loving Heavenly Father. This is something that comes out very strongly in the Psalms and in Psalm 36. The psalmist says, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. Let us pray. God, our Father, we stand before the wonder and mystery of your creation, and we see your being reflected. Your love and faithfulness, as infinite as the great expanse of the universe. Your righteousness, as enduring as the highest mountains. Your justice, 
unfathomable as the deepest ocean. There is so much that is beyond us, so much that will always be a cause of wonder and remain a mystery. And yet, in Jesus, O oh God, you have stood where we stand before the creation to celebrate its beauty and mourn its brokenness. In Jesus, you saw the creatures. You inhaled the fragrances. You heard the bird song. But you also confronted the death and the decay. So we praise you that you were in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself. That once again, there would be perfect harmony between the creator and the creation. We pray that this vision would touch us in the depths as we ask forgiveness for everything in our lives that disrupts relationships, everything that damages the environment, everything that speaks of death and decay. Help us to practice reconciliation, to feel the weight of our responsibility, to experience the life that you long to see flowing from us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read together in God's word in the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, Psalm 11. These are the words of David, who says, In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. Thanks be to God for his word. We sing together now, O Holy Dove. Let us pray. God, our Father, you are the creator of all things. And it is your great purpose to renew the earth of which we are a part. And we pray now that as we give ourselves to your word, that your Holy Spirit would renew us from within, so that everything that resists your call 
and wonders from your ways is dealt with in the light and peace of your presence. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, it has been said that the mark of a great military leader is knowing when to retreat. It's not always the worst thing that can happen to an army if they turn their back on the, the conflict. It's an opportunity for them to avoid further casualties. It's an opportunity for them to, to regroup and an opportunity perhaps to plan the next advance. It's not always the worst thing to retreat. Yet we do see in the life of David at times rather when he was on the run. You remember that as a courtier of King Saul, the king suddenly took against David and David was forced to abandon the court and to live like an outlaw. There was another occasion when he was king of, of Israel and his son Absalom led a rebellion against him and again David was on the run. We're not absolutely sure about the background to this particular psalm, Psalm 11. But we do know that it was a moment of crisis in the life of David. It was a moment when his life was actually in danger. And he was receiving advice from friends which were quite clear, really. They were telling him to flee, to flee like a bird to your mountain. These are the words that we find in Psalm 11. We're not absolutely sure where the mountain was, but it's clear that at that particular moment, those who were closest to David were saying to him that his only option was to take to that place. But what David decides at this particular time, though he knows the value of retreat, what he decides at this particular moment is that he will stand in the midst of all the pressure that's weighing down upon him. He begins the, the psalm, as he remembers this time, he begins the psalm by saying, In the Lord I take refuge. At this particular time, his heart will turn to his God in trust that God will supply all the resources he needs to see out this moment. And there is a sense in which part of the psalm is, is a reflection on the being of this God that, that David knows. A God who's present with his people. A God who knows what's going on in the minds and the hearts of men and women. A God whose justice will not sleep forever. And it's my hope that as we examine those different aspects of God's being, that we will learn to appreciate them more as they have been more fully revealed in the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. But David can say, in the Lord I take refuge, because he has experienced the presence of God in his life. He knows that his is a God who is present. He says in, in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. There was no temple in David's day, no physical temple. But David is, is speaking of a heavenly temple here. God is in his heaven and it's from that place that all the, all the strength, all the peace, all the hope that his people need, all of this is flowing from him into the lives 
of his people. Therefore David could say, In this Lord who is present to me in every moment, I take refuge. He is with me. And that, of course, is the great promise of the the eternal covenant that God had made with the people of Israel. A promise that we've been reflecting on quite often in, in, in recent days. This simple promise of God to his people. I am with you. This was the greatest promise of all. This the creator of the universe, the one who had established the nation of of Israel, who overruled all the other nations in the world. He's saying to his people, I will be God for you. And when we turn to our Lord Jesus, we can see that he extended this promise and deepened this promise when he said to his disciples, I will be with you always. To the end of the age. In every moment that you go through. Whether it's dark. Whether it's bright. Whether it's pleasing. Whether it's painful. Whether you're up or down. I am with you. Always. And David is taking refuge. In that. In that promise. You know, I've often heard people over the years, friends, say that they're not believers in a conventional way, but sometimes they stand before one of the wonders of of nature or they hear beautiful music or they lose themselves in in a poem or a novel or a movie and they just feel that there is something beyond themselves. And David is quite sure about that something. It is God from whom all goodness, all love, all joy flows. When somebody experiences that something beyond themselves, this is God calling on in the depths of their being to recognize who he is. And that's something beyond for David is, is, is not a God who's distant. Not a God who is detached from the affairs of, of men and women. Because this is a God who knows. A God who knows the minds and the hearts of men and women. He says in his psalm, he observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, his soul hates. Now, this is a God that you can't kid. This is a God who looks into the depths of people's minds, into the depths of their very being. A God who is involved to that, to that extent. He knows those who are for him. And he knows those who are against him. David knows that he is for his God. And so he is confident that he can take refuge in him. He knows that he belongs to this God. And that his purpose for David is good and it's loving. And again, we see this extended and deepened in our Lord Jesus Christ, friends. In the gospel, according to to John, we're told that there was a moment in Jesus' ministry when there there were jaw-dropping miracles being performed by our Lord. People were gasping in wonder at what he was doing. They were responding to him as the great military, as a great miracle worker. But what John tells us is that Jesus didn't get carried away with this response. In fact, he was wary of it. He knew what was in a man, says John. 
He knew that you could be up in people's estimation one day and down in the next. And so he didn't entrust himself to public opinion. Jesus, as the good shepherd, in his role as the good shepherd, says, I know my sheep. He looks into the depths of our minds and our hearts. He knows if we are with him. And he goes on to say that those who are with him will never be snatched from his hand. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. No one will snatch them out of my hand. This is the assurance that David had as he stood in his moment of danger. It's the assurance that we can all have as we remember our Lord Jesus and his promises to us. David's devotion reveals to us a God who's present, a God who knows, and also a God who is just. David says, On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. We look at the God who's revealed in Scripture. We look at the God who's revealed in the life of our Lord Jesus and we are pretty soon convinced that this is a God who makes promises. And one of the great promises that flows through the the whole of Scripture from beginning to end is that there will be a day when the whole of creation is renewed and everything that flows from God will be the dominant values in that new creation including justice. Justice is among those values that will be dominant at the end of all things. It was a vision that the prophets had hundreds of years before our Lord Jesus when the desert would bloom, when everything that speaks of decay and death will be left behind and there will be a new life to enjoy. It's what our Lord Jesus promised when he said that after his death, after his death, resurrection and ascension into heaven, he would come back, not this time, as the baby in a manger, but as the Lord of the universe. The Apostle Paul looked forward to that day in great anticipation when he, when he said to the, the, the Christians in Ephesus that on that day, at that time, everything in heaven and on earth would be united in Christ. His voice would be heard, says the Apostle John throughout the universe declaring his purpose. I am making all things new. And that is the faith on which we need to stand at this moment, friends. The foundations will never be destroyed as David's advisors feared because God has his plan. And nothing will stop God fulfilling the promises that he has made concerning humankind, concerning the whole of creation. Let us pray. God, our Father, we praise you that on these occasions, when we feel the foundations trembling beneath us, you come to us with the assurance of your presence the knowledge that we belong to you, a vision of the justice that will be established at the end of all things. We praise you that we have been caught up in your great purpose as we have learned of you and have come to know you 
and all that you have done for us through the life and witness of Jesus. We ask in this moment that you accept our lives dedicated once again to the values of the kingdom that you have promised will one day prevail. We offer prayer for your church that her vision will never be dimmed, that her compassion will never be exhausted, that her faithfulness will be ever strong. We offer prayer for the world that the climate change that threatens the poorest nations will be eased as we learn better stewardship of the environment. We pray for the world leaders gathered in Glasgow this week that global awareness will prevail over self-interest and visions of a cleaner, more just and more productive planet emerge. We pray for our own nation that no one will ever feel neglected, ignored, despised, and that those seeking to change harmful ways in their lifestyle will find the support they need. We pray for those we meet and hear of in our daily lives who struggle with ill health, who have been devastated with bereavement, whose quality of life is diminished through mental health problems. All of this we bring to you in faith and pray that you would stay with us now as together we say the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We sing together, my life flows on in endless song.
And now may you go in peace to love and to serve the Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.